This sermon was originally preached at Jerseyville Baptist Church on September the 29th, 2024. It is entitled Preaching the Light in a Dark World. Unfortunately, there were technical issues with the original recording of the sermon, and so this is a re-preaching of the message based on 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 6. For our first scripture reading, I am going to read Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seal and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nations. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and on the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Now before the preaching of the word, I am going to read Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 18. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth, we plainly commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Christ, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. 
for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. How would you characterize this world in which we live? If you had to describe our world, what would you say? Some think to themselves with Louis Armstrong that it is a wonderful world because there is much to enjoy and to delight in when admiring the creation and in observing human kindness. Others struggle with the inconsistencies of our home and pen the lyric, what kind of world is this? What does the Bible say? What is our experience as Christians? There is a sense in which, because God created this world, that we see glimmers of its wonder. We observe things that delight us and warm our hearts. We know that this world is also a world that is groaning. As we engage the world, believers are reminded of the darkness that is present. We live in an environment that is hostile to the Lord Jesus. We live in a world that did not receive him. The Apostle John writes, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Jesus is the light of the world. He shines proclaiming that which is true and good, and yet he was rejected because people love sin. It is not only that their deeds were evil, but they enjoy their wickedness. They delight in it. They do not want to change and walk in the light. Given a choice, standing at the crossroads, they would rather walk in darkness and take that path then follow Jesus. This is the nature of our world. We see so many expressions of the misery and brokenness in this world caused by sin and its consequences that it causes us to weep. The trauma that humans have inflicted on one another, the tragedies and the wickedness is overwhelming. All too often, darkness seems to triumph. The hymn writer notes, And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. However, we do not despair because there is hope. The word of God is light and life. There is a way by which people are brought out of the darkness and into the light. The way is Jesus. In 2 Corinthians, Paul calls himself a minister of the new covenant. In chapter 3, he clearly argued that the new covenant, the message of Jesus Christ, is better than the old covenant. The old covenant, the way that God related to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, led to condemnation, separation, and death. In it, there was no hope. It was not the means by which God could dwell with humanity in peace. It didn't work. However, the new covenant is more glorious, for it is an eternal covenant that brings life and righteousness and delivers sinners from death. In the new covenant, the Holy Spirit is at work, shining the light of Christ into our hearts, bringing life and enabling us to continue to walk in the light. The message of the gospel gives hope. It gives hope to sinners. Paul begins chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians with the word, therefore. In light of his discussion about the glory of the new covenant, he is going to continue to teach the Corinthians both about the new covenant itself and also about his role as a minister of the new covenant. As we come to this chapter, Paul has at least three key things in the back of his mind that inform what he is speaking about here. Three items, three ideas that are in the background which impacts him as he pens these words. So we want to take note of these three things. And first, as we saw last week, the experience of Moses and the people of Israel, especially what is recorded in Exodus 32 through 34, is very much on his mind. Those chapters speak about the golden calf incident, Moses' reaction to that, and then his prayers to the Lord, that he might see his glory, for he needed to be encouraged. He also expresses his concern to God that he dwell with them. 
And we also see recorded the fact that after being in God's presence, Moses' face shone, and so he put on a veil. Second, as Paul pens these words, he also has in mind his personal experience on the Damascus Road, where he literally saw the light of God's glory as Jesus spoke to him. That event impacted Paul greatly, as on that day he beheld the beauty of Jesus, his Lord and Savior, who called him to salvation and to minister among the Gentiles. And then third, Paul in this section is responding to his opponents, who bring up all sorts of objections to him and his ministry. They make a host of accusations against Paul, trying to undermine his authority and discredit his teaching. And so there is this diverse background, these three ideas that are in Paul's mind as he writes this chapter. And what he does in these verses is emphasize the glory of Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. He shines in the darkness. Those who follow Jesus are to behold and delight in his light. And then we are to shine as lights in the world. We are to let our lights shine so that people might see the hope that is within us and they might seek the Savior and glorify God. We are going to break down these six verses, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6, into three sections. And our first point is the nature of gospel ministry. The purpose of this letter is to explain to the Corinthians the nature of the gospel and of gospel ministers. See, the gospel is glorious and amazing. It is the message of truth, power, victory, and eternal hope. Paul points them to the Lord Jesus Christ and declares how incredible and awesome Jesus is. But the reality and the truth of the gospel does not mean that the gospel ministry is impressive and that gospel ministers are going to be grand individuals. In fact, the reality is quite opposite. God uses the weak things of this world to magnify his strength and glory. God uses jars of clay to show his all-surpassing power. Paul's opponents did not understand that. When they saw the weakness and the suffering that characterized Paul and his ministry, they mocked. They levied all sorts of accusations against him because he was not impressive. The connection they made in their mind was that a ministry like Paul's could surely not be God's truth and the way of the Almighty. So Paul seeks to set them straight and teaches them the truth about the new covenant ministry. And what he says in these verses first is that it is a merciful ministry. The message of Jesus is itself a message of mercy. The old covenant failed to bring people into a relationship with God, but the law did teach of the need for forgiveness and salvation. And the law further declared that blood could be shed for the atonement of a sinner. And God mercifully sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus shed his blood so that we might be saved and cleansed and brought close to God. And those like Paul, who are called to proclaim the message, have been mercifully called. God could have left Paul in darkness. But the light of God shone in Paul's life. God opened his eyes on the Damascus Road. Jesus revealed himself to Paul as he saw the blinding light and the glory of God. Paul understood the truth that Jesus is the light. He is the way. He is the means by which one might come to God and know his mercy. God told Paul that he has the privilege of being God's chosen instrument to bring the good news to the Gentiles. Paul understood that it is a great privilege to be a minister of the new covenant. It is a mercy of God that he was called, that he was so blessed to not only receive this message, but to be able and to be equipped to declare it to others. It is a merciful ministry, but it is also a difficult ministry. Paul says that it is through God's mercy that they do not lose heart. 
This is an accusation that Paul had to deal with. His opponents claimed that he did not press on in the ministry. For example, they would say that he didn't come to Corinth when he said he would. He changes his plans. He does what is comfortable and convenient. He loses heart. And Paul says that's not true. Even in suffering and hardship, he has not and does not lose heart. There is much that could cause a faithful minister in general, and Paul in particular, to be discouraged and give up. The gospel ministry that Paul has been mercifully called to is a hard ministry. He has suffered for the gospel of Jesus Christ. His travels involve a variety of hardships and dangers. He is at times without food or companionship. He has been shipwrecked and gone through all manner of dangers for the cause of Christ. In addition, he has had to deal with opposition and persecution. Paul has made enemies, and they seek his life. People try to hurt and harm him because they do not like what he teaches. Even among those who have responded to his teaching, there's difficulty. He deals with problematic churches, like the one in Corinth, for whom he weeps and prays for, and for whom he contends against false teachers. It is a hard ministry, but Paul embraces the suffering, not because he loves pain, but because he loves the Savior. He delights in God's mercy, and he wants others to hear the good news. The ministry is a merciful ministry, and it is a hard ministry. And thirdly, it is a pure ministry. What motivated Paul to press on in the ministry? Was it personal gain and acclaim? Paul wants the church in Corinth to reflect on his conduct among them, what they have seen and experienced, and weigh that against the accusations made against him. He knows that if they think about his character and priorities and how he was among them, they will see how misguided and off the mark the accusations are. Paul says that he and his colleagues have renounced secret and shameful ways. He declares that there is an authenticity and genuineness in his ministry. He is laboring not to try and build a name for himself or to get rich off of the gospel, but he has pure motives. In 1 Corinthians 9.18, Paul writes, What then is my reward? And just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. He says that it would have been legitimate and reasonable for him to expect to receive remuneration for his ministry. But he didn't. He didn't charge them. He did not expect payment from them for the great service that he rendered to them. And they know that. Paul's ministry is one of pure motives. And then finally, in, this, in these verses, Paul tells us that his ministry is a true ministry. The New Covenant ministry is one that is based on mercy. It is hard, it is pure, and it is truthful. Despite what his accusers may say, Paul teaches the truth of God to them. He did not use deceptions or distort the word of God. Now again, Paul's opponents would accuse him of these things. They would accuse him of distorting the word of God, particularly in how he applied the law to his message of the new covenant. For example, Paul says that believers, Gentile believers, did not need to be circumcised or follow other practices found in the law in order to have a full and complete relationship with God. He declares that Jesus is enough. And his opponents did not agree with him. They were so tied to the law, to the words that are written in the books of Moses, that they could not conceive of how anybody could be spiritually mature, how anybody could have any degree of righteousness without fulfilling these things. But Paul proclaimed the message of the new covenant, that Jesus did all the works that are necessary. And so our righteousness is found in him and not on what we do. Jesus is enough. But his opponents who emphasized the law accused him of distorting God's word. And Paul says that not only is this not the case, in fact, he has already referenced in this letter that it is his opponents 
who actually distort the word of God. They do not see how Christ is the fulfillment of all of God's plans. They do not exalt Jesus. And so they are actually the ones who have a deficient view of God's word. Paul knows that what he preaches is the truth. Because the gospel he proclaims, he has received directly from Jesus Christ. He writes to the Galatians in Galatians 1, 11 and 12. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. He declares the truth that he has learned directly from Christ. So then, if they say that he distorts God's words, that means that they are not only questioning Paul, but they are also questioning the source of Paul's gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But Paul rebuffs them by saying that he has set forth the truth plainly. He has faithfully preached the gospel message, the way of salvation. He has declared to them Jesus Christ and him crucified. As a result, he says, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Consider our ministry. Take what you have heard us preach and bring it to God. Talk to God about what the truth is. Well, this is Paul's ministry, a ministry that he says that is hard, but it is a ministry of mercy, of purity, and of truth. Well, why are these verses important to us? What are we in the 21st century to learn about Paul and his ministry? And how do we apply these things to our lives? What we see is set before us a true and a false ministry. And there will be true teachers, faithful gospel preachers, ministers of the new covenant, like Paul. And these are the ones to whom we are to listen and follow and learn from. But on the other hand, there are false teachers. There are false teachers everywhere. You can find them online, on the TV, on the radio. Well, how can we identify who preaches the truth and who doesn't? How can we know who is a false teacher? Well, a faithful minister is one who exalts Jesus Christ. Paul's ministry was focused on Jesus. And that is true of all faithful ministers. Their desire, their burden, will be to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and to put the attention of their audience on the Lord. Paul says, that's what I did among you. You know how I conducted myself. Your consciences bear witness to the authenticity of our ministry. And so in the first place, we see Paul and the nature of, of the gospel ministry. Our second point from verses 3 and 4a is the response to gospel ministry. Paul says that there are some who they hear what we preach and teach and they reject it. And the reason why they reject it is because for them, they find the gospel to be veiled. For those who are in Christ, those who have the Holy Spirit, the veil has been removed. They understand God's truth and behold him with unveiled faces. They see clearly. But the consciences of unveiled people, sorry, the consciences of unveiled people will affirm his ministry. However, the consciences of veiled people will not. But what it shows is that their minds are veiled. And what Paul is doing is he's picking up on this language of veiling, which he has talked about in chapter 3. And he identified veiling with the Old Covenant. Moses, after being in the presence of God, would veil his face. 
And further, in chapter 3, the Apostle noted that when the Old Covenant is read, the hearts and minds of some are dull and veiled, and they do not see clearly the ways and workings of God in the Old Testament. And so, because of this veiling on the hearts and minds of some, there are two responses to the message that he proclaims. Some whose hearts are tender and who have responded to Jesus Christ affirm what Paul preaches the Spirit of God within them testifies to the veracity of what Paul proclaims. But on the other hand, some reject Paul's message. They reject him as a teacher and an apostle. They do so not because of any deficiency in the message, not because he does not preach the truth, not because of any fault of the messenger, but because of their sinful, fallen, veiled hearts and minds. The gospel is veiled to some. And the reason why it is veiled to some is not because there's a problem with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but the problem is with those who are rejecting it. Remember the parable of the soils. The sower sows the seed, but there are four types of soils, four responses to the gospel message. Some hear the word, receive it, and rejoice in it, and bear much fruit. But others hear the gospel, and it lands on their hearts. But they do not receive it. It does not take root, and there is no fruit. And the problem is not with the seed. It's the same seed that's sown. But it is with the soil. And he further says that those whose hearts are veiled are those who are perishing. They're on the path to destruction. And this is a very sobering thing to say. Eternity is at stake. Paul is talking to them about the way to life. And those who don't go, come to Christ are on the path that leads to destruction. Eternal death. Hell. And no doubt he says this, weeping and grieving, knowing that individuals have hearts that are veiled and darkened, and they do not receive the beautiful truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. They do not come to him in repentance and faith. And the question is, why do they not turn? Why do they not see their danger and respond to the gospel? And it's because they are spiritually blind. They do not rightly see things as they are. Paul says that they are blinded by the God of this age. And that is a reference to Satan. Satan is a defeated foe. Jesus has conquered him and has won the decisive battle. Yet the age in which we live is still one of activity for Satan. He knows his end. But before he is consigned to the lake of the fire, he is going to try and cause as much damage as he possibly can to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, which he hates. Satan knows that he cannot hurt or harm God the Father or God the Son directly. But what he does strive to do is hurt and harm God's people. He is our enemy. He is a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And he tries to devour God's people. And so Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we are to put on the armor of God because there are spiritual enemies that we contend with. The devil tries to hurt and harm God's people, but also in his animosity towards the kingdom of light, he tries to keep unbelievers far away from the Savior. From the kingdom of God. Many of you are aware of C.S. Lewis's work entitled Screwtape Letters. The book contains letters written from a senior demon to a junior demon, advising him on how to blind the mind of an unbeliever so that he will not seek Jesus and find salvation in him. And Lewis, as much as a human can, reveals much about demonic thinking and strategies in the book. There are all sorts of tactics that the devil uses. The devil tells all manner of lies, falsehoods, and half-truths to deceive people and to keep them from God. 
He lies to this world, to unbelievers. He lies to them about what reality is. He wants them to be living in a deception. He lies to them about how pleasurable and good sin is. He tells them that it will satisfy. It will bless their life. They are to enjoy it. And that there won't be any consequences. He lies to them about God and salvation. He undermines God's character, trying to get people to question God's goodness. He further attacks the clarity of God's word, saying, did God really say? Satan promises hope and peace when there isn't any. He will tell any lie to keep people in the dark and away from God. If someone has spiritual stirrings, then Satan tries to distract them. Like a bird, he seeks to pluck the seed of the gospel out of a sinner's heart before it can take root. He will emphasize that it is hard to follow Jesus. And so he tells people that it isn't worth it. And you may be familiar with John Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress. And at the very beginning, when Pilgrim is heading towards the wicked gate, there are two individuals that he encounters from the town. And one of them, his name is Pliable. And he is a man who is easily led. And so he listens to Christian and he thinks, that sounds good. And so he wants to go with Christian to the wicked gate. And before they get to the wicked gate, the place of salvation, they encounter the slough of despond. And as they fall in, and as Pliable realizes how difficult this path is, he decides to turn away. He goes back to the city of destruction. And that's what Satan wants to do in people's hearts and lives. He wants to emphasize how difficult God's path is. And so he tells people, don't even go there. Don't start on that path. He lies to those in the world, telling them that they are critical and free thinkers, and that they are too wise and sophisticated for biblical superstition. But in reality, they are his slaves, bound to him and to thinking his thoughts after him. And they view the world from his perspective. The other day I saw a clip of a TV show, and there were two individuals featured, and one was a psychologist steeped in science, and this individual was presented as wise and discerning and has it all together. And then on the flip side, there was this individual was contrasted with a person of faith who was viewed as being simple and weak-minded and just really not someone to be emulated and respected. And Satan loves to speak and to say that sort of thing. He is subtle, persistent, and dangerous. He will tell people anything to keep them from God. He keeps people in darkness, striving to blind unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel. This world in which we live is a spiritually blind world, one that is influenced and led along by the God of the age, who keeps people in darkness and away from the light. He teaches them to fear and to hate the light. And how do we respond to such a world? How did the Apostle Paul respond to such a world? Well, Paul knew that he has the message of light. He knows the one who can bring light into the midst of the darkness. And so Paul runs, as it were, towards the darkness with the light held out before him, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ so that people would turn to him in repentance and faith, that they would be saved, that they would find hope in Jesus Christ. We do not need to fear, for the one we serve is greater than the one who tries to keep the world in darkness. Satan cannot succeed, for the message of light is greater and more powerful than the message of darkness. 
And that brings us to our third point, the light of the gospel. And we see this in verses 4b to 6. Satan tries to blind people so they cannot see the light of the gospel. He does not want people to have the truth revealed to them. He does not want sinners to know and love and worship Jesus. But he cannot keep everyone in darkness. The Holy Spirit, who is infinitely more powerful than Satan, penetrates the hearts of men and women and young people, showing them, showing us, how great and glorious Jesus Christ is. And the Spirit creates in us an affection in our hearts for the Lord and Savior. See, Paul remembers well what happened on the road to Damascus. He was a man who set out on this journey with a heart that was blinded by the God of this age. He trusted in himself and his works to make himself right before God. He thought he had everything figured out. He was proud and self-reliant. But Satan could not keep Paul in darkness. He could not prevent what happened on that road. There was a brilliant light as Jesus revealed himself and his glory to Paul. Paul got a glimpse, a taste of the magnificence and glory of Jesus Christ. And he was enthralled and ecstatic. He knew that this was the truth that he needed to seek after. This was the truth that he needed to behold and grasp. He learned that Jesus is the Christ. Well, what does Paul tell us here in this passage about Jesus? And first, that Christ is the glory. The light of the gospel, he writes, displays the glory of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the glorious one. What is the gospel? And Lord willing, you will have the opportunity to talk to people, neighbors, friends, co-workers, fellow students about Jesus. And if they ask what you believe, what will you say? Can you give a brief summary of the gospel? Can you Boil it down to a brief one or two minute synopsis, which emphasizes the critical points of the gospel. The gospel message. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came from heaven to live a perfect life and to offer himself on the cross as a sacrifice. He did this so that by faith we might be forgiven of our sins, receive his righteousness, and dwell with God forever in heaven. This is the gospel. And the truth of the gospel, the light, magnifies Jesus. When we consider what the gospel is, the gospel message, we see how great Jesus is. It, as Paul says, displays the glory of Jesus. It opens our eyes to how awesome the Lord is. In the gospel, we see the power, the wisdom, the purity, the love, the mercy of Jesus. In the gospel, we see how Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies that pointed towards the Messiah and to the Lamb of God and to the one who is the prophet, the priest, and the king. The gospel declares that it is all about Jesus and that he is worthy. We read earlier from Revelation chapter 5, and they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Jesus is worshipped in heaven. The living creatures, the elders, bow down before him. And his people here on earth delight in the glimpse of his glory that we understand. And then we look forward to appreciating his glory in a far greater way in heaven. Christ is the glory. And Christ, Paul says, is the image of God. The message that Satan blinds people to is the gospel that displays the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. How can we know God? How can we be in a relationship with God? 
It is through the one who reveals God to us, the one who is his image, Jesus Christ. And Paul, as he writes these words, is again thinking about what he saw on the road to Damascus. He saw the vision of light and brilliance and found it to be the most powerful, true, and wonderful thing. His heart was delighted with the revelation of the glory of Jesus Christ, the one who is the image of the invisible God. You want to know God. You want to see the glory of God. Then look at Jesus. John writes, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Paul is giving us a wonderful Christology here, a glorious teaching about Jesus. In chapter 3, he wrote much about why the new covenant is better than the old covenant. But the teaching of why the new covenant is better than the old covenant can be summarized in one word. Jesus. Jesus is what makes the covenant better. He is the one who makes the covenant effective. It is by him that we can come to God and find forgiveness and salvation and eternal life. Christ is the glory. Christ is the image of God. And Christ is the message. We do not preach ourselves, Paul says. The false teachers made accusations about Paul's motives. They said that what Paul was doing was uh, preaching a message that would puff himself up, which would exalt him in the eyes of people. But Paul says that he didn't preach to promote himself and to impress others and gain a following for his own benefit. His message was Jesus. He wanted people to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul views himself as a servant for Jesus' sake. And because he has this understanding, he submits himself to Jesus and the call of Jesus on his life, which is to serve others by preaching the good news all around the world. The Corinthians are not to be confused by Paul's humble life, by his life of suffering and weakness. This is what God's people should expect in the present as they proclaim the message of light to a dark world. He preached Jesus Christ. He pointed people to Jesus because he had come to understand that Jesus is Lord. Paul teaches us in this verse. He writes that the message that he proclaims in verse 5 is that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is over all and rules over all. Who is the Lord of Lords? Caesar is not Lord. He is a human ruler with limited authority. Satan is not Lord. He is a fallen angel given partial temporary jurisdiction in this world, but his time will end and his doom is sure. We are not Lord. We are not in charge of our own lives and accountable to no one. Jesus is the Lord. He is the one who rules and reigns over all. He is our king and our God. And those who live in darkness do not see this. They do not comprehend that Jesus is God's forever king, the one who has been prophesied of from the earliest pages of the scriptures, the one who fulfills all of the messianic expectations. Jesus is on the throne. He is the one who is worshipped. Paul writes, In Philippians, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Christ is Lord. And one day, everyone will acknowledge that. Do you? Do you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord? in your hearts, and in your lives? Does your life, your decisions, your actions, how you spend your time, how you use your money, reveal that you revere Christ as Lord? And finally, 
Christ is the light in our hearts. In Genesis, God said, let there be light. And there was light. The light shone and dispelled the darkness. And similarly, the apostle says that our hearts are by nature dark. All human hearts are lost in sin and are dark. But the same God who said, let there be light in Genesis 1, has made his light shine in our hearts. He, through the Holy Spirit, has personally revealed the truth, the light to us. The light that has shone in our hearts gives us the light of knowledge. Adam and Eve, they wanted knowledge. They wanted to understand. They coveted divine insight. But true knowledge comes from God the enlightening of our hearts, the understanding of what truly is, comes from above. And what is it that we need to see and understand? We need to see and understand the glory of God displayed in the face of Christ. Moses' face was veiled. The glory of God that was reflected in Moses' face was covered. But the glory of God that is displayed in the face of Christ is not covered. That is what we are to look at and focus on. It is in the Lord Jesus Christ that we find all that our hearts and souls are yearning for. We see the fullness of the glory of God in the face of the risen and ascended Christ. That is what the message that Paul is preaching about, preaching is all about. And so when we return to the historical setting, the question is, what do the false teachers, what do Paul's opponents preach and teach? Do they have a message that is this glorious? Can they explain to people how they can see and behold the glory of God? Do they give you a hope like this, Paul says? And the reality is, a message, a gospel without Christ is not good news. The message that Paul preaches is the one in which they can know and see and grasp and enjoy and delight in the glory of God forever and ever. And so what can we take home from this? What is our application? And the first, we've seen that this world is a dark and needy world. The God of this age is active. He is trying to do much damage. And so we need to be aware of his schemes. We need to put on the full armor of God. But we also know that God can make his light shine in hearts. That's what he's done for us. And that is what he can do for others. And that is what he is doing for others. And so we are to go and to tell others about the light. We are to hold forth the word of light so that they might hear the good news of Jesus Christ and have the opportunity to repent and be saved. And then as we think about the fact that Jesus is the light, we are to walk in fellowship with the light. And this means that we are to have a desire for holiness. Jesus is pure, and we are being conformed to his image. We are being made more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we think about the brilliance of his glory and the light of his being, we are to desire to be pure and holy ourselves. And so we are to be putting sin to death. And we are to be striving for obedience. Also, in terms of walking in fellowship with the light, this gives us assurance for our hope. Our hope is not derived from our obedience or how good we are or how much light we generate in and of ourselves. Our hope comes from beholding the one who is the light, the one who is the image of the invisible God. And by clinging to him, by being found in him, we can have the hope, the confidence that we are genuinely saved. And finally, walking in fellowship with the light. 
should cause us to rejoice in the glory of Jesus Christ. This is what satisfies our souls. This is what blesses our hearts. This is what we have been made for as God's creatures to understand and delight in the glory of God the Father and God the Son. May this be our portion now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word and for your truth. I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ in whom there is light and life. And our Father, bless us as we live in this world that is characterized by darkness. Help us to value the light, to treasure the light, and to let it shine. Bless each and every one of us, our Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.